For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The Lord's obituary on uh, Jacob. You can see it's not very long. So that tells you something right there. When Jacob finished charging his sons, that's chapter 19, uh, uh, 40, I mean 48, 49, could even include 47. When he finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. Now there's there's a a simple picture of death. I suppose that for most of us we would take that. <laughs> uh, we would ask, well, what did they die from? And here's what they would say from natural causes. Right? People would say when they don't really um, we had the funeral today of Mrs. Widgeon. Uh, that's Dave Widgeon's mom. Uh, he uh, preached the sermon. Of course, Angie said, my hero did wonderful, and I could believe that. That'd be a tough tour, though. That one's a tough one. Um, but people ask all the time, what did Mrs. Widgeon die from? That's a, I think that's a common. And um, it just depends how you view it and how much ministry you want the way you answer it, isn't it? I mean, sometimes I'll use an Ecclesiastes or I will frame it, my answer I'll frame in some kind of maybe Psalms 116, 15. I'll always give something um, if I think there's ministry opportunity because it's a great question, isn't it? And... Um, <clears throat> For Mrs. Widgeon, that's an Ecclesiastes 3 moment. She died a natural death, time to be born, a time to die. And uh, that's kind of with Jacob. It says, he drew his feet into, his, into the bed, breathed his last, was gathered to his people. As you know, he's a patriarch. Therefore, for some of us, we're interested in patriarchs. We're interested in how they enter their ministry, how they lived it, and how they exited it. When you read Abraham's obituary, it's not like that. When you read Isaac's obituary, it's not like that. There's one key phrase missing that the other ones have. It's a Hebrew word, sabia. I wrote it on your paper down there in the middle somewhere. You'll see it in the Hebrew. It looks like a W with a, with a dot on the left. That's an S and an A underneath it. And then that next letter going to the left is a B with an E under it. And then high end is silent, you have an A under it. So that when you write it out, you have S-A-B-E-A. -E you see that? Um, and it's an interesting word. And it's where our title comes from tonight, Satisfied with Life. Satisfied, this is the word that's used, dependent on context, of course, but um, when Abraham died, this word is used. When Isaac died, this word is used. But when Jacob died, this word is not used. When Job died, this word is used. But with Jacob, this word is not used. 
And so for some of us, that's, that's like a red flag. Because he is a patriarch. A patriarch. Well, the question I would ask you today before we have our study is within your own soul, not looking for an answer, of course, but within your own soul as you reflect on your life as it sits here today, not where you come from, not where it may be going, but today as you evaluate Tuesday night, the question would be, are you satisfied with your life today? Are you satisfied with it? And what you think about that a moment? Because your answer to that is really important to yourself. How you answer that honestly within your own soul is very important to you. For example, if you thought no, or if you thought not really, you are probably thinking about something you consider outside your control. And when you do that, <clears throat> that's a no-no, by the way. When you do that, you've missed the word satisfied. You've missed the word. You've missed the word satisfied. And let me tell you, if there's one thing you need to be satisfied with every day of your life, it's with your life in Christ. This word is missed more than you can imagine in the church. Most counseling that I have, I don't have a lot with personal problems. They're all, they all go to Al or somebody else in the church, Tony, probably Horton, probably a whole lot of you women. But this word satisfied is really important because I meet so many people who are not satisfied with their life as Christians, they're not satisfied. You ask the average guy on an average day this question, and he'll give you no, or he'll give you the other, not really. I hear it a lot. I hope this lesson will help us tonight to get a hold of this word, satisfied. Satisfied. Because if there's one person in this whole wide world that ought to be satisfied with their life, it's a born-again believer. Because all the work to bring you into satisfaction has been provided for you by grace and not of yourself as a gift. And this is a key word that God reflects on in your life. He wants you to be satisfied. Now, we know that life don't always deal us a great hand. But we can still be satisfied. That's a choice. It's a choice. It is possible, in my study tonight, I'm going to show you that it is possible to be a spiritual mature believer, engaged in the work of the Lord, have family members engaged in the work of the Lord, and still not be satisfied with their life. Jacob was such a person. Jacob was such a person. So tonight we're going to look after a word of prayer. We're going to come back and we're going to take a look at four aspects of this satisfied with life. If there's one group of people in the whole wide world that should be satisfied with their life, it's a born-again person. We have nothing to not be satisfied with. So, let's have a word of prayer. We'll get into this study based on the obituary that God wrote about Jacob. Because he did not put the word sabia there. It's not there. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. It is the privilege of the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach you the truth of the Word of God. That's why the Holy Spirit, one of the reasons, you can't study the Bible in the carnality as a believer. 
therefore, how do I identify carnality? Personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, could be sins of the tongue, or could be overt sins. Holy Spirit's got you because he's been quenched, he's been grieved. He does conviction besides your conscience. I mean, well, so what do you do to get back into fellowship with the ministry of the Holy Spirit? You confess your sin, First John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So I expect you, that's classroom etiquette for us, whether you've traveled here by automobile or by internet. This is what we, we call this classroom etiquette, people, and uh, it's important we take part. <coughs> uh, Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for your grace that's provided everything for us to be here today with freedom. I know many of the brothers in Christ around the world do not have this freedom. To have this kind of freedom, they have to be in a cave or something. We get letters from the mission field where they block out their, their, um, their pictures because there's such hostility against Christians. My question would be to those, are you satisfied with your life in Christ? Are you satisfied? I'm not talking about satisfied with all of the conflict going on in your life, but satisfied with life in spite of it. We're going to learn how to be that person tonight. We're going to, we're going to talk about how to be victorious within our own soul it has nothing to do with the circumstances of life. It has to do with our relationship with the Lord. And that is how we are satisfied with the Lord, no matter. It's not based on circumstances. It's not based on things around us, the things that surround us. Mm -mm. It's those things that are in us. So we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at point number one. <clears throat> the evidence that Jacob was not satisfied with the life given to him by the Lord is found in his obituary written by the Lord. It's not there. When you read God's obituary of the other patriarchs, it becomes clear that it's not there. For example, when you read the obituary in Genesis 25, uh, uh, verse 8 and thereabout, uh, he dies at 175 years of age. And Sabia is there. In the NAS, it's described an old man satisfied with life. That's an accurate Sabia. The NIV translates it full of years. And that's okay too, but the emphasis, the word satisfied is not how long you lived. It's how long, how long you're satisfied with how long you lived. And so the NAS picked it up absolutely on Abraham and the NIV uh, went to full of years. When we come to Isaac in the 35th chapter, verse 29, he lived to be 180 years of age. He lives in our dispensation, in our, uh, not dispensation, but in our civilization. He lives in the post-Diluvian. <clears throat> he lived to be 180 years old. And in his obituary, we have the word sabia. It's translated in the NAS, an old man of a ripe age, meaning satisfied with his days. The NIV stays consistent with the word sabia, full of years. But it's important that you understand they're looking at age, not quality. Jacob, in our passage, 49, 33, lives to be 147. And there is no sabia in the Hebrew. It simply says that when Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into bed, breathed his last, was gathered to his people. I mean, it's a boom, boom, gone. Now, that's a good thing. It's a good thing that he's going to be gathered to his people. And we would call that that Jacob died a natural death. But of the three patriarchs, he's the youngest. 
Disney. By far the youngest. Sabia was not used at all with Jacob. Yet all three patriarchs lived beyond their age limit. In Genesis 6-3, the age limit that God put was 120. Moses outstretched it. I mean, not Moses, but Abraham outstretched it. Uh, Isaac outstretched Abraham's. And Jake, Jacob didn't make either one of them. So when the NIV, that bothers me, when the NIV translates this full of years, well, yeah, if you're looking at the benchmark of 120, they went beyond it, and that's a good thing. Um, but from a patriarch standpoint, it wasn't. Um, and, of course, that's what we look for. Remember Psalms 90, verse 10. I'm going to tell you what it says. Here's what it says. I'm, I'm going to give you Ron Adema. <coughs> there. It says, you've hit your prime when you're 70 and 80. You've hit your prime. This is not the time to shut down shop, roll over, and play dead. This is the time to put your boots on and get into warfare. Moses, part of this group of guys, post alluvian lived to be 120. His ministry didn't really kick off until he was 80. Uh, that verifies that kind of thing. So, listen, stop listening to the world tell you this foolishness. Stop listening to the world tell you that you're going to die at a certain age and you're old when you're 60 or they give you discounts when you're 55. I'll take discounts every day, but not because I'm 55. Um, a person came in the day, was real excited, came in to talk to me because they got the discount at the register. And yet they were a little disappointed because they asked her. <laughs> I mean, you can't have it both ways, can you? Well, anyhow. Uh, this Hebrew word, Literally, if you're just looking at a literal translation, it means to reach full limits. Now, it depends on whether context, whether you're talking about the body and maybe talking about age and health, or whether you're talking about the soul and spiritual growth and maturity. And this would be what? This word, sabia, would be a word that we would use in describing um, spiritual growth, uh, super grace a person who has reached super grace status. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, let me tell you, one of the things you know very sure when you've hit super grace <clears throat> is you're never looking back. You don't give a rip from where you came from. You don't care how God drug you up and drug you out and did all this stuff. <clears throat> Your eyes are focused on where you're going, not where you've been. I mean, Paul talks that way. You know, in, in 2 Timothy 4, uh, seven, seven, eight, nine, ten. In that, you know, um, the writer of Hebrew talks about it in the twelfth chapter. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Paul talks about it in Colossians, the third chapter, when he says, "Don't put your don't put your focus on things below. Put your eyes on things above." That's how you know you're in super grace. You don't give a rip about what this down here. I mean, this is just you're a pilgrim. Mr. Farmer loved that. You're just a pilgrim. He loved pilgrim's progress. You're just a pilgrim. Your, your citizenship isn't even here. Your true citizenship is in heaven. But anyhow. At the age of 147, Jacob was senile in body, but not in soul. We know that from Genesis 47, 9 and 28. It is in context there that we are told that his eyes, the eyes of Israel were dim from age that he could not see. But chapter 47, 48 and 49, he does miraculous prophecy that extends all the way to the coming of Christ. I'm talking about a second. When you go in there 
one of the great studies, and someday I'll maybe get to it. But when you look at the 12, you, you look at his prophecy of the 12 tribes. Now, the one everybody focuses on is Judah, of course, because Christ is going to come from the tribe of Judah, and Judah is going to be a big deal in the second coming, you know, the lion business. But what he lays out to these guys are prophetic historically, the, the history. And, um, you know, that someday when you're sitting at the beach wondering what you want to do, you might pull out your Bible and, and read that. That's stuff I do. I know other people don't do that, but I do it. The evidence that Jacob was not senile in his soul was his clarity of prophecy given in chapters 47, 48, and 49. Yet he died not satisfied with his life. I thought a lot about that. If you know anything about Jacob, then you know probably his history. And a lot of it he just struggled to get beyond. For example, Jacob's trials and tribulation just burdened him in his life. He just couldn't seem to move on beyond it. For example, he left home at a very young age in trouble. You know, oh, lying, deceiving, deceit, and all that kind of stuff with Esau and his dad, uh, promoted by his mother. Then he goes off and he gets connected with a guy called Laban who was just a, a shyster. The last guy in the whole world that Jacob needed to hook up with was a mafia king. The last guy he needed to hook up with because he already had that, he was already deceitful and cunning, right? The last guy in the whole world that he needed to go to school with was a, a mafia king. But needless to say, uh, God, uh, God permitted that. And so he goes through this whole thing with Laban and he's cheated by him both in business and in marriage and all that. You know the story of Leah and, and Rachel, uh, um, all of that story. And then, and then the death of Rachel, when he's saying goodbye to Joseph. He calls Joseph in for a special meeting. Tells Joseph, I, I want you in charge. I want you to be the executor of my will. He tells his son something that happened in his life way back when. It still bothered him. And it was the death of Rachel. She died giving birth to Benjamin. And she wanted to call him the son, the son of my sorrow, of my great pain. And Isaac wouldn't do it. Uh, I mean, uh, Jacob wouldn't do it, and he called him Benjamin. It gave him a positive name, not a negative. You know, it's kind of interesting how you name your kids. Huh? Of course, it was really important in Hebrew. Um so that bothers him. So he's still struggling with that. You can read about her death and how it affected him in 35. It's still affecting him in 48. And, and then his family's a mess. I mean, they're a mess to the end of the book of Genesis. They're still a mess. When, when he dies and, and, and then they're worried with what Jacob, uh, Joseph is going to do. And you just couldn't. I mean, the family was a mess. Now look, we all got this kind of stuff in our life. It's, it's being alive in the devil's world, people. We all have this kind of stuff, maybe not just this, but we all come from gobbledygook stuff. You know, sometimes it's decision people make on us, and sometimes it's, it's decision we, we put on ourselves. But we all go through this kind of, oh, I wish I hadn't, oh, jeez, I, I, I. God wants you to be satisfied with your life. He wants you to deal with it, properly deal with it, and move on. Quit dragging up the past. It's a dead horse. Quit, quit dragging up the back. Stop. You know, I keep saying to people that all the time, they, I'll talk to somebody and they're still, they're still burdened about something that happened 10 years ago. And I go, you're carrying a dead man on your back. 
You're carrying a dead man on your back. This is a corpse. So, if you look at the life of Jacob, you wonder, well, why? What is about Jacob? He just never could. Listen, here's the guy. Just about the time something bad happens, something worse comes along. And he doesn't understand what God is trying to do in his life. And so he tries to recover from bad going to worse. And the next thing you know, worse has gone to worse. And now he can't seem to get out of worse. Because he's not paying attention to Romans. I want you to go to Romans 5 with me a moment. He's not paying attention to this important passage. I mean, stuff happens. You're not going to go through the devil's world without stuff happening. Sometimes it's your bad decision. Sometimes it's other people's bad decision. Romans 5, we're going to look at, well, we'll just start. Verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, boy, that peace is really important. This is peace that you have with God. You're going to get the, this is a peace that you have by, as a gift. This is a salvation gift. You have peace. But listen, that same peace that comes from the character of God to you as a gift, comes from the character of God to you as a gift, is now yours by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead. Because one of the fruit of the Spirit is that peace. 100% God. When the Holy Spirit produces this peace, just like this peace that I have is a positional peace, 100% God. And any time I need that 100% peace from God, it's not about being saved now. It's about being spiritual. If I will walk in the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will work in my life. I can have peace in the midst of that. I don't care what it is. And I can have perfect peace that passes all understanding. Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace. Stand and exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, now he's going to move on. You got this. Then he says, not only this, but we also exult in tribulation. Exult in tribulation. You know what that is? That's you on top of it, not it on top of you. At some point, you got to flip them over. This, this bad experience, whether it came, however it came to your life, this tribulation you need to exalt in tribulation. You've got to flip it. You have to flip it. You know why faith is important? Because God honors what He's promised. It's not dependent on you. The results of faith, your faith, the results of it depends on the character of God. You know, Romans 4.21. Exult in tribulations. All right, now he says, watch this. Knowing that tribulations, see, that's how, that's, that's how it slaps us right in the face. We, I was having a good day. Everything was hunky-dory. <laughs> I was looking for this, that, oh, wowdy, wowdy. And all of a sudden, boom, right out of, the, right out of nowhere, I got popped upside the head. Right? This is what we're talking about. Exalted and true. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perf perseverance brings about proven character. Proven character brings hope. Hope does not disappoint because this hope is in God. It says because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And all of that because at, while we were helpless in verse 6, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. I mean, how good is that? Look, tribulation comes to your life. It's a normal part of doing business with the world, in the world. It's a normal. And when it comes, embrace it. Persevere. Look, look what he tells you. Persevere. 
It will prove character. It will develop hope. This hope will not disappoint because you are oriented to the love of God that has been poured out in your soul by the Holy Spirit. How about that? How about that? Here's the second thing. See, and, and what Joseph was talking about when we looked at this list of Joseph, it was just tribulation. Now, you know, it's just tribulation uh, when it's my, mine or yours, you know. It's your tribulation. Uh, you ought to be able to suck up and get over it. But when it's my tribulation, then I sit around and whine and complain. And, all right. All right. J here's, here's the same thing. Jacob may have thought that he didn't have any control over his trials and tribulations. That may be true. Right? That may be true. What do you do? You flip it. You persevere. Perseverance develops character. Character develops hope. Hope develops the identity of the love of God in your heart. It develops, the, it develops your relationship with God. See, this love of God that's poured out into your soul, that's the perfect love of God that you got at salvation. Now you're struggling with it. Listen, all you have to do, just come back to it. The fruit of the Spirit is this love. It's there. Why would you sit and moan and groan and, and grumble and complain? About tribulations, that's a, listen, John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation. Be of good courage. Be of good courage. Be of good courage. That's a mental attitude. That's a, a relaxed mental attitude. Listen, when you read Matthew 6, let's just go there for a little bit. Matthew 6, you're familiar with this passage. He, 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 Jesus really talks about this thing, about worry and anxiety of tribulation, how, it affect, how tribulation affects your life uh, in a negative and positive way. Nothing. Tribulation. You live in this world, you will have tribulation. The secret is to flip it and be encouraged. Uh, Christ has overcome the world. So in Matthew, I mean, Matthew, you know, Matthew, this famous passage in Matthew, if I can find it, 6th chapter, um, verse 25. He says, he's gone, he's, this is part of an extended study. He says, for this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body. See, we spend so much money so much time, so much everything on our body when what is important is our soul. Your body's going to age. Your body's going to die. What about your soul? What about your soul? Is not life more than food and the body than clothing? Is life not more than? I mean... And I, people come in, and they're so distraught over things, over details of life. Things. Just things. So what? What, what, would, be, what would be the, so you lost it. So what? And they go like, Ugh. well, I said, are you the richest man in America? I, that's what I say to them when they come in. I got a, what? What would, I mean, so you lost it all. <laughs> they don't even talk that way. I said, are you the richest man in America? I mean, far out, because they number them every day out there, periodically. They number the richest men in, in the world, in the United States. I'm not asking, are you the richest man in the world? But are you the, are you the richest man? Can I find your name when that thing comes out? Are you the richest man in the United States? Well, I haven't met one so far that said yes. Well, I can tell you one that was, that went through a lot worse than you're going through, and his name was Job. He was the richest man in the world. 
And he lost everything, even his health. And it was all about Romans, the fifth chapter. And when he died, because he flipped every tribulation he had, he flipped it back to God. He didn't, try, he didn't wear, let it wear him down. He flipped that back to God. He just flipped that thing back to God. And when he died in the 42nd chapter, the word sabia is with his obituary. But God knows when you're satisfied with life. You can't, you can't snooker him. And he loves to put that word in your obituary. Well, in this passage, you need to pay attention in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. When you read it again at home sometime, pay attention to who decides what. <laughs> pay attention to who decides what about your life. Because you say, see, we think it's us. And listen, when you run your life based on that, it'll always get screwed up. You know, if you really believe in the sovereignty of God, then let him run it. Then let him run it. If you believe in sovereignty. Now, if you don't believe it, see, a lot of people believe it mentally. They, I mean, they're smart enough to figure out vocabulary. Sovereignty says, God's got it. What do I care? I'm going to flip this back on him. Cast all your cares. This is the thing, whole thing about it. Cast all your cares back on him because he cares about it. It's all about cares. Why are you, care, why, why are you carrying the cares? <laughs> why do you care? That's what I say to people. Why do you care? And then flip it. F give it to somebody who really cares and can do something about it. That's, to me, that's what Peter is saying in 1 Peter 5. But it's interesting, when you go in there and you read about this, listen to what he's asking when he says, who decides what in your life? And then he's going to tell us in verse 34 of Matthew 6, each day, and boy, I mean, you know this by the time you hit 16. For sure, by the time you get to 16, at least I knew it. I had this principle down. Each day has enough trouble of its own. No sense carrying any from yesterday into tomorrow. It is one of those cosmic diabolicus lies of worldly thinking pushed by the devil to distract believers from the truth. This idea that you can't be satisfied with life. It doesn't mean that you don't have tribulation. It doesn't mean you've got challenges in your life to be satisfied with it. But listen, you've got to learn to flip that thing to God. When you flip it to God, you can be satisfied with it because he's in charge of it now. You're not. And at some point, you've got to do that kind of stuff. At some point, you got to do that. The devil loves to distract the believer from the truth of God's word for his life. For example, he did it with Eve. Right? He did it with Eve. He, he lied to her. Right? He lied, lied, lied. 2 Corinthians 11.3 talks about it in more detail. John 8.44. And then I gave you a bunch of passages in there that are well worth your time. Satisfied with life. Here it is. For me, at least. And I know you probably have a favorite verse for yourself, and that's good, but here's mine. Satisfied with life. This is a verse that keeps me, keeps me centered. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Look at the word life. Look at the word live, lives, live, live, and the word life. The word life is mentioned once, but what you're doing is living that life. You're going to live somebody's life. Why not live the life of Christ? Philippians 121, he uh, uh, this clicks in, in Paul's life, and he, he says, uh, for me to live is Christ and die is gain. For me to live is Christ. And what's he doing? I mean, it, it, do you think he's not having tribulation? Well, of course he's having tribulation. I mean, holy catfish, when, when, listen, when you read 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, and he talks about tribulation for, for Christ's sake, 
You would never go on a mission trip. You'd never leave your house. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what this guy suffered for Christ's sake to preach the gospel to get people saved. See, I think we understand the price that Christ paid for sin, but we don't understand the price that's required for us to preach that message. We don't have to pay the price. We have to pay the price for preaching it. If you want to study it, you can study Paul. Paul goes over this with you. <clears throat> Three, we understand that the same God who is sovereign over our days is sovereign over the events of our life. In Job 14.5, his days are determined. Talking about man. Man's days are determined. The number of his months is with you, Lord. And his limits you have set so that he cannot pass. I mean, you got to accept that. I mean, that's a given. We understand that's sovereignty. That's a sovereignty of God. Not only is he over our days and our months, but the events of them. Ecclesiastes 3, the activities of the event of the days. He talks about that in Ecclesiastes 3. Well worth your time. About 20 verses in there. Well worth your time to read. In Ecclesiastes 3.15, in that passage, he says, that which has been already, listen to this, that which is, has been already, You missed it. That which is has been already. God has all of that under control. It's not you, but him. And that which will be has already been. You know why? This is sovereignty. This is so for God seeks what has passed by. You know, people go like, oh, man, I missed the job of my life. Oh, I missed the, the, the person of my life. Oh, I missed this and I missed that. What are you talking about? You're talking about being miserable. Listen, he says it well, for God seeks what has passed by. Flip it over. Flip it to God who, who, ne who nothing passed by him. In Job 42, 17, uh, God gives his obituary and he says, Job died, an old man full of days. Uh-uh. That's the word sabia, satisfied with life. And if you know anything about the life of Job, and, and we do, but we studied it, you know this is true. Not, not an old man full of years. A man... An old man still filled with, a, with God. He died at 140. What did these three believers, Abraham, Isaac, and Job, what did these three believers learn doctrinally and accept that Jacob didn't? See, there's my message. What, what did these other guys hear and believe that Jacob didn't? And that is, you can be satisfied with life. I don't care what hand is dealt you. You can be satisfied with it, but you've got to turn it over to God. You've got to give it to God. You can't, don't try to wrestle it out, Jacob. Jacob, listen, every time he got in tribulation, what did he try to do? He tried to wrestle with God, right? God had to finally uh, cripple him so that he'd have a reminder, stop doing that, right? It was Job that did, I mean, uh, Jacob that did that. Listen, if, if you learn nothing, learn that from them. What did these believers learn that gave them soul vigor while rigor mortis was setting in their bodies? Because it, it happened to all of them, right? I mean, what did they, what did they learn that gave them? Because, boy, when they died, they were full of soul vigor. Their eyes may be a little dim, but their, their brain and soul wasn't. You know why? Because they learned to renew their spirit every day. My final point. Hooray. 
right? Is 2 Corinthians. This was Sylvia Dennis's very favorite passage. I could have preached on this every week and she'd have been happy. I can't tell you how many trips we took as a couple's where we discuss this in great theological length. Here's what this says in 14, 16, 14 through, knowing that he who raised Jesus, I mean 14, uh, I want to go to 16. I don't want to pick all that up. Uh, verse 16, therefore, well, see, therefore always requires you to go, why is therefore there? So you have to back up anyhow, but so see the word therefore. Actually, this is the word deo, this is not the word therefore. This is not un. This is D-I-O. This is D-I-O. D-I-O. D-I-O means because of this. Verse 16. Because of this we do not lose heart. Lose heart means to become discouraged and depressed. Because of, because of this. Not therefore, but because of this. Now look, you go back to verse 8. And here's what Paul is talking about. Uh, and, and I know you've read this. Afflicted in every way but not crushed. Perplexed but not despaired. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down, not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. That life of Christ also may be manifested in our lives. For we, for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal bodies. So death works in us, but life works in you, the recipient of our message. See, he's talking about, he's talking about, he's talking about suffering for the sake of Christ. Suffering to carry the message of Christ. And then there, when he says, therefore, and on the bottom of your page, I wrote, I wrote down five things, 16, 17, and 18. Watch this now. Therefore, based on undeserved suffering for Christ's sake, we do not lose heart. See that? We do not lose. It's a present active indicative. I didn't put that there. But, but it means to be discouraged, to lose courage, to lose courage in the midst of the battle. You know what I mean? In the midst of the battle. Listen, he means, he means the battle like in verse, in verse uh, 8. Afflicted, not crushed. Perplexed, not despaired. See, he's talking about that. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, not destroyed. See, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's absolutely talking about. What's he doing? He's flipping that thing. He's flipping it. He's, he's putting it on, on God, who is more than willing to take it. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. <clears throat> and so, do not lose heart. Do not be, become discouraged. And listen, what is causing, listen to me now, what's causing the discouragement? Tribulation. That comes from your identity with Christ in the world of the devil. John 16, 33. Do you see that? <clears throat> again I think it I think it's 2 Corinthians 11 where he makes a list of, of his missionary trips and all the conflict he goes through there's a whole list of it there that's overwhelming what is the flip thought when he says do not lose heart what are you losing it to listen to me now here's what you're losing it to doubt fear Anxiety, not being able to stay in control. That's what it's about. You understand that? That's what he's saying. Do you know what it robs? You know what it robs you when you become discouraged on the things that are natural and normal? You ought to be in Romans 5, but you're not. Right? You're, you're in the loony bin. You, you ought to, listen. Listen, all of, that, all of that is important for you to understand. What, what that stuff does is rob you from a satisfied life. It robs you. It robs you from that doubt, that fear, that anxiety. What's going to happen? Where's my next meal coming from? What is this? What is that? Listen. Listen. What that does, listen, flip that thing. Give that to God. Do you not know that he says, look, I took, do I, 
look, if you can't, you got a little, you got a piece of bread or something, you got old stuff, you're going to, don't throw it in the garbage, give it to me. No, well, get it out of the garbage. Okay, let me, let's go outside and let's throw it out there and let's see the squirrels and the birds and whatever kind of animals we didn't know we had in our backyard. Right? Because there's a great lesson there, isn't it? Right? Isn't that what Jesus said? There's your lesson. God takes care of you. It, it, I mean, are you not worth more? I mean, Christ didn't die for a canary. I don't think. I have to be careful about saying that. Somebody will come up with a canary. Uh, well, see right there, there's a canary in heaven. Um, the, the second thing is that he talks about the difference between an outer body and an inner body. An outer, and a, an outer man and an inner man. The outer man is a body. The inner man is a soul. See, see he, says, he says, the outer man is decaying. The inner man is being renewed. Now watch this. Day by day. Not one time a week. That's how many days are there in a week? Okay. How many days are there in a month? Okay. How many days in a year? Okay. Let's see if we can make it a year and then we'll count again. Day by day. What's he talking about? He's talking about inhale, exhale of the word of God. That's how you flip this stuff. What does God's word say to my life? He has a word for you. Whether you accept it or not, well, <laughs> I don't know. The outer man is decaying. That's senility of the body. But the inner man is being renewed day by day, and that's the key. The key is to not pay attention to what's going on with the body, he said it in Matthew 6. Don't be anxious for food and all that, the body. Don't, don't do that. Listen, he's got that covered. Uh, take it outside and feed the birds. And sit and watch. See the word affliction? Look at the word affliction. I, I think in your Bible it's in verse 17. Momentary light afflictions. Now, boy, you got to have a heart for God to call the tribulations in your light, light, momentary light afflictions, right? Well, I just had my stomach opened up and everything pulled out and replaced. <laughs> what do you call that? Your problem, not mine. No, what do you call it in the Bible? <laughs> You're not going to like this. We call that momentary light afflictions. <laughs> See why I'm not good at hospital calls? I'm not good. These afflictions that we're talking about in verses 8, 9, 10 and so, right? Because of the word deo. They're called, they're called, listen, God calls it this. God calls it momentary light afflictions that produce. Now watch this now. This is important. It's there to produce now, what's this? Momentary light. Agreed? Afflictions. Producing. It's producing. Watch this now. Light of faith is producing for us an eternal heavy weight of glory. Oh, we started with afflictions and we wound up with glory. We, we, listen, and the reason it's called momentary light compared to what it produces. Flip that baby and let it produce eternal weighty glory to God for your life. Whoo! I mean, that's as good as it gets, people. And I guess that's a good place to stop. Don't be discouraged. Father, we're so thankful for uh, all of these that have come by automobile and those, Father, that have visited with us by the Internet. Um, we're thankful to have you visit with us in our Bible study. And we pray that the Lord has helped you. Because the key is, what does the Bible say? Because that's where we put our faith, and faith always works because God is faithful. I mean, the bottom line is 
faith must have a working object. And no matter what the Bible says, the working object behind whatever the Bible promises is the character of God. We've talked about sovereignty tonight and other issues, but we're thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life.